can see on Twitter and on YouTube and all over the place that everybody's struggling with these financial markets. How the hell do we invest? How do we make sense of this world? It's too complicated. There's too many things. What the hell is a yield curve? What does it mean to me? How does inflation play into my portfolio? These kind of questions are really important and they remain unanswered to this day. And that's why we've done something very different at Real Vision. We've actually decided to solve that problem at scale affordably for everybody. That is the Real Vision Academy and the Real Vision Investing course. We've created this incredible structured course so you can truly learn how to navigate financial markets and become a better manager of your own portfolio, your own wealth and your own destiny. These are so important. The other thing about the courses that you find online, not only do they charge you a fortune, but it's basically done by somebody who's got no experience in financial markets. This is different. This is built by the head of proprietary trading at Goldman Sachs Equities in London, who also worked with me at the GLG Global Macro Hedge Fund, Lex Van Dam. We took his incredible course, which he trained people for the BBC show Million Dollars Traders and turned it into something truly spectacular, taking it to when Lex never dreamed it could go. Now, Real Vision is always a little bit different as well. We don't make learning boring. I mean, we've filmed some of these videos in extraordinary places like bunkers underground to pubs. We want to make it feel natural, interesting, immersive. So when you come out the other side, you are a better investor. If you join us now, you get an incredible discount. Go to realvision.com forward slash the academy. See you there. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Andreas Steno, the senior editor at Real Vision, sending to you live Wednesday, the 27th of July, hot on the heels of the Federal Reserve meeting. Another 75 basis points uh, of hikes, but very few commitments to the path ahead. And uh, with me to unpack all of the action surrounding this Fed meeting is a friend of mine, the founder of 42 Macro, Darius Dale. Didi, my man, how are you? Uh, feeling squeezed today, my friend. How you doing, brother? How you been? Uh, a bit the same feeling here, to be honest. Uh, but Darius, let's get to it. Um, another 75 basis points, and uh, yet... We had a market reaction with uh, long bond deals dropping initially and equities, they party like there's no tomorrow. What the hell is going on with that market reaction? Yeah, so the market reaction was really just a function of the setup coming into the meeting. Um, if you look at our crowding analysis, which somebody put out a, a, a model out every morning on, you know, the S&P 500 came into today with a 25% volatility risk premium on a very near term basis. So that effectively got all washed out. Um, just really uh, with Powell offering um, a, a, a sort of a pivot, if you will, towards open-ended guidance. Now, let me be very clear, uh, this is not an effectual policy pivot, but it was a pivot um, to focusing on more sort of data dependency as opposed to providing a, a more clear path to guidance. He said, quote, uh, we think it's time to go on a meeting-to-meeting -meeting basis and not provide the kind of clear guidance we provided on the way to neutral. So markets uh, took that and said, hey, look, let me get rid of this uh, near-term and high volatility risk premium. The event risk is now behind us. Yeah, and it almost sounded like he uh, received the notes from Christine Lagarde from the European Central Bank last week. She used the exact same wording, we're going to take this meeting by meeting. Darius, I wanted to play a, a soundbite for you, um, and it's from a discussion you had live yesterday uh, on the Real Vision platform um, ahead of the meeting today. So let's listen to the soundbite and uh, continue the discussion afterwards. Yeah, so I mean, just go back to sort of their framework, right? We got to put ourselves in their shoes when we try to evaluate the decisions that these folks will make at any given interval, right? Like they, they have this framework, <laughs> we can all debate and discuss it. Uh, about neutral interest rates and whatever the you know neutral interest rate of the economy is, and their estimation, at least according to Powell, uh, two meetings ago, uh, was that levels are right around twenty two point five percent. And so there's been a lot of talk amongst policymakers, Bullard in particular, about getting to neutral really quickly, front end loading the rate hikes, and then you know particularly uh, potentially being able to pause at that uh, at that moment in time. So I think you know seventy five basis points is priced in the futures markets. Why not just take the shot and uh, get it over with? So Dar Darius, you basically nailed uh, the meeting uh, today uh, in the live <laughs> discussion yesterday, but still you seem a bit surprised by the market reaction. What's changed? 
Oh, well, no, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm surprised by the market reaction, positioned poorly for the market reaction, to be clear, uh, but certainly not surprised. I mean, anytime you go into uh, any event, particularly one of, of this consequence, with a 25% volatility risk premium and something as, as massive as the SPY, uh, you're going to get that wash out in an event ball. You know, it takes a, a hell of a lot from a, from a, a you know, hawkish surprise perspective uh, and in order for that not to catalyze and unwind. But I'd be very clear that, you know, you, ne you might not necessarily want to chase this. You go back to the last... Uh, two FOMC meetings, which obviously also had a build up in event ball into the um, into the catalyst. You know, on May fourth, we we were up three percent on the FOMC meeting as that volatility risk premium got uh, decayed. Uh, but then we were down three point six percent the next day. Um, similar dynamics happened in uh, last FOMC meeting in mid June. On uh, June fifteenth, we were up one point five percent on the day of the FOMC. Um, then we ultimately decayed minus three point three percent. Uh, in the following day. So, um, you know, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware that it's not necessarily anything that Powell said or did that is creating a medium term path for, um, you know, for sort of a, for, for, for more sanguine markets. This is a lot has a lot more to do with kind of near term volatility premium uh, rear term positioning in the volatility markets. Uh, you mentioned initially that Powell basically decided to end forward guidance today. Um, the Fed will take a meeting by meeting approach to decisions now. Uh, and my own opinion um, towards the discussion uh, of the end of forward guidance is that it could actually end up increasing volatility. What do you make of that discussion? Yeah, I mean, it's my, it's likely to end up increasing volatility in the in the rate space, but the reality is, I mean, I think that the, when you when you remove forward guidance from the perspective of policymakers, now we are on our own as market participants to sort of guess the likely outcome, both with respect to the economy, but also um, in terms of how the economy feeds back into policy. So um, this is we're heading into a period where you're going to need to have good forecasts uh, of what's likely to happen on growth and what's likely to happen on inflation in order to get the Fed reaction function ready. If we look at the uh, Fed funds rate after today, two and a half percent is now the ceiling for the Fed funds rate. And Powell um, basically said that this is now around the neutral range for the Fed funds rate. If we then look ahead, labor markets will be a deciding factor for the Federal Reserve and inflation will be a deciding factor for the Federal Reserve. What do you make of the labor market and the inflation outlook and then ultimately the outlook for Federal Reserve hikes? Yeah, so this is something I, I really uh, talked uh, in, in great detail with uh, yesterday, my friends uh, Stephen Van Meter and Jeff Snyder uh, on the Real Vision uh, platform. If the Fed is now shifting to a sort of back towards its dual mandate, you have to realize that its dual mandate is very lagged with respect to um, the financial markets. Um, it's obviously got a, a maximum employment mandate and then the price stability mandate, which has been the primary focus throughout the year to date. Um, so I sent a couple charts to you, Brian. Uh, the first um, chart is slide 82 from our, our most recent uh, macro scouting report presentation, which we put out monthly. Um, the title of the slide is the labor market is too strong for the Fed to stop tightening. And what this chart shows in the upper panel uh, is the jolts job opening, total job openings. The red dotted line just shows where the most recent print is relative to the overall time series as far back as we have the data. Um, the next dotted line or the next um, panel shows the quits rate at 3.1 percent, obviously still extremely elevated relative to where we have the data. And then lastly, the employment cost index uh, at 4.5 percent in the most recent print is as high as we've ever seen in the time series. So, you know, you look at those three factors together and then you take that in conjunction uh, on slide 83. Brian <clears throat> put up that bar chart, slide 83. Uh, you take you take the sort of the kind of the level of the activity in the labor market with respect to how tight it is. But then you also take the momentum in the labor market. What I'm showing in this chart, the light blue bars in this chart of the 2015 to 2019 trend of the, the trend growth rate uh, of private of these uh, various indicators. The gray bar is the most recent month and the blue bars are the most is the is the oh, sorry, the gray bar is the penultimate month and the blue bars are the most recent month. And as you can see in private payrolls, hourly earnings, that's the second cluster of bar and the fourth cluster of bars, private sector uh, aggregate labor income. We are literally growing at a rate through the June jobs report um, at a rate that's double the 2015 to 2019 trend in these statistics. So not only is the labor market extremely tight just from a levels perspective, the momentum is incredibly robust. And this is something that, in our opinion, because the labor market is a lagging indicator to both the GDP cycle, but also obviously the market cycle, this likely means that if they're focused on employment, they're going to over tighten and, and, and make the recession that we're likely to experience deeper and more protracted. 
key question after today, Darius, is how far we can go above the neutral rate. And I think we can bring up a chart uh, on the euro dollar futures pricing, indicating that the market um, expects the Federal Reserve to go, say, 90 to 100 basis points above neutral. Um, is that too much, uh, in your opinion, or uh, what do you expect for the path ahead? Uh, yeah, and I'd, I'd be the first one to tell you that like this sort of concept of neutral interest rates is a, is a very wonky, um, <laughs> loose concept. You only really know it after the fact. So uh, I'm not going to sort of throw <laughs> I'm not going to throw an estimate of what the the ultimate level um, uh, that we can go past neutral is. But the reality is the markets are going to tell us. And this is the problem with looking at economic statistics to guide policy. Right, the policy works on um, you know long and variable lags. You know, per, per their own guidance, not mine with respect to its impact on the economy. And so if they're looking at the most lagging indicators in the economy, they're naturally gonna set themselves up for, for, for creating a worse outcome economically than they otherwise would. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, clearly Powell gave us some guidance on recession, right? He got a bunch of questions on recession. And I thought, you know, kind of one one statement he made was, was probably in my opinion, the key takeaway of the meeting outside of the shift to, uh, to removal for guidance, which was, um, you know, we're not trying to have a recession and we don't think we have to. Uh, we know that the path is narrow based on events that are outside of our control, and it may narrow further, uh, but restoring price stability is just something that we just have to do. And to me, it says that, hey, look, we understand that there's recession risk, but push come to shove, unless things are all hell's breaking loose in financial markets from a financial condition standpoint, we're probably not going to be able to really materially pivot, certainly aren't going to be able to start cutting rates and doing QE as, as quickly as some of the market hopes. One of the widely debated recession indicators is the shape of the uh, yield curve. And we have an increasing amount of tenors that are now inverted on the uh, dollar yield curve. We have two tens in uh, deeply inverted territory. Uh, we even have a version of the Fed favorite, the spread between uh, the three-month rate and then the three-month rate in 18 months from now being inverted as of now, if you look at the Fed fund's future. Uh, so, I mean, Darius, how many tenors will have to invert before Powell changes his mind? <laughs> Yeah, so this this is the great question, man. And and so this is sort of goes back to kind of some of the things that we we're talking about in yesterday's uh, discussion, which is we are as market participants or sort of, you know, it's our job to, to make money in financial markets. In order to do that, you have to have a view, you have to have a position, and ultimately that position needs to be rewarded by the market. For the Fed, the Fed is operating on a completely different sort of, you know, kind of set of objectives, right? The Fed is trying to achieve economic outcomes. So the Fed can't look at the yield curve, which it, by the way, is influencing with both the size of its balance sheet uh, and the change in its balance sheet and interest rate policy as an indicator for what it, it should also do from a policy standpoint. The Fed has to react to, to economic statistics and ultimately gauge the sort of, um, you know, based on forecasting tools. Um, you know, there's thousands of PhD economists at the uh, the Fed that ostensibly know what they're doing, but clearly have, have not in recent years. But anyway, I digress. You know, it's their job to look at economic statistics, forecast those economic statistics in order to get them into the right policy setting. And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. And obviously they were so wrong last year that it's leading to them to, to maintain this sort of hawkish bias and, and well into a growth slowdown. In our opinion, if the Fed was look as a, acting as an investor, they would have stopped hiking interest rates a while ago. They would have stopped doing QT a while ago because we've already sowed the, sown the seeds of a pretty significant slowdown already uh, if you look at the leading indicators for growth. Um, Powell received a bunch of questions on the recession risks today at the press conference. And at least initially, um, during the first couple of questions, he kept referring back to inflation when he was um, questioned about the recession risks. Do you think inflation matters more than the potential recession risk for the Federal Reserve at this juncture? Yeah, without question. I mean, he said it He said it verbatim. He said that we do see that there is a risk of doing too much, i.e. pushing the economy into a deeper uh, slowdown than it otherwise needs to have. But he also said the risk of doing too little was too great. I mean, that's as simple as and non-binary or so simple and binary as it, it can possibly be. And then the one thing that also was um, reiterated from the last um, uh, press conference was this sort of concept that, um, you know, that that sort of the, the, the labor market, the sort of labor market, their, their price, their maximum employment mandate is conditional on their price stability mandate, which means they don't believe that they can achieve maximum employment anyway if price stability um, 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 features are not met. So at the end of the day, you know, this meeting is a lot, a lot less about what is the Fed telling us they're going to do and more about 
pushing the sort of you know, kind of um, the responsibility back to us as investors to, to generate forecasts, have views and put positions on in markets. And you either have a view that we're going to have a mild recession and it's priced in, or you have a view that every incremental step of tightening these people do beyond, let's call it May or June, is going to make whatever recession we have uh, deeper and more protracted. Uh, and that's certainly our view. If we uh, take a step back and look at some of the other questions at the press conference, uh, some of them uh, were related to the debate on the price target of the Federal Reserve. Um, Powell received a question um, on the target variable being the PCE price index, which mm -hmm. is currently growing at clearly uh, less rapid levels than the consumer price index. Uh, Powell kept reiterating that PCE is the actual target variable, but it wasn't a completely crystal clear answer. What do you make of that debate with CPI growing at such a fast pace compared to the actual target variable? Yeah, no, I thought that was interesting. Uh, he didn't say anything definitive, so it's not clear that we should, as investors, change the, our perception of the Fed's reaction function based on this particular discussion. Um, you know, we have a couple of charts in there that kind of contextualize what's happening in inflation. If you go to slide 85, Brian, uh, where we show core CPI, core goods CPI, and core services CPI, similar analysis as the prior bar chart, which is the, the, the latest three-month annualized uh, inflation rate is in the blue and the penultimate is in the gray. And as you can see, core CPI pressures are accelerating on a momentum basis. Again, this is not year over year. This is three-month annualized. You know, we are building momentum sequentially uh, in core CPI, core goods CPI, and core services CPI, which is also at the fastest, it's growing at the fastest rate we've seen since August of 1990. But that's not the issue as it relates to this interplay between uh, CPI and core PC. The interplay is on the next chart, Brian, on slide 87, where we show median CPI, sticky CPI, and core PCE. Uh, median CPI on a three-month annualized rate of change basis is growing at the fastest rate we've ever seen. So it's telling you that we have a very significant broadening of inflation pressures that we have never seen before. It's not just energy, food, or housing. It's literally everything in the dang index, uh, certainly relative to the, the, the time series. And then sticky CPI, uh, that accelerated in June to the fastest rate we've seen since August 82. So the reason I highlight these two particular indicators is because those are the things that are most correlated with core PCE which is sort of, you know, the fouls say that's not their target objective, but the reality is that is definitely the thing that guides policy the most uh, as it relates to their longer term structural views on the terminal Fed funds rate, et cetera. So whether it's P headline CPI or core PCE, all we know is that these things are actually getting worse, not better. If we look at the spread between the median print of the PCE price index and the median uh, print in the CPI index, uh, that spread is basically more or less all time wide. Uh, and um, in history, we've only observed such big spreads right ahead of uh, a material economic slowdown. Do you think this is an indicator that the slowdown is right ahead of us again? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, so let me let me be very clear. Like we we came into the year, uh, we you know we said something at the beginning of the year that ultimately became consensus, which is you know people aren't talking about a recession enough. They're not talking about the U.S. economy growing uh, below trend as opposed to above trend. Go back to January, the consensus view was that growth would be very well above trend. Um, we were you know recession was at best a 2024 event. Obviously now we're talking about one that may materialize by the end of this year. Um, the second thing we said, going back to the early part of the year, was we are likely to have an earnings recession. Um, I think that the jury, uh, you know, clearly Q2 earnings have been generally well received. Um, but you know, just from an outlook perspective, if we get the kind of growth slowdown uh, that we have projected in our models throughout Q3 and Q4, we will have an earnings recession and, uh, and potentially pretty deep uh, earnings recession. So to, uh, to answer your question, as a long-winded answer, my friend, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's very much in the cards. We we already have a significant slowing of growth baked into the cake based on the shock we've seen in real interest rates. And we can see a lot of this in the leading indicators, whether you look at the PMIs, whether you look at the consumer confidence data. So it's already happening and it's just gonna get worse every time the Fed hikes rates again, every time that balance sheet continues to contract. Uh, Brian, we can bring up a, a model on the ISM PMI number um, based on the regional PMIs that we've received uh, from various regional uh, Federal Reserve banks across the country. Uh, and it looks, 
pretty bleak or dark ahead of the next print for the ISM manufacturing number. I even think there is a risk that we could go sub 50 in the uh, coming month or, or two. And tomorrow I will release an article on how to position for, for, for such a, a move in the PMI below 50. Basically, it's not good news for, for risk assets in, uh, in my humble opinion, if we get below uh, 50. Darius, would you concur with the view that we get PMIs below 50 within a quarter from now or so? Oh, definitely. I mean, <laughs> it's already, I mean, yeah, you can look at the leading indicators like inventories of sales or sort of new orders, inventories, et cetera, like that. It's already at it below 50. And this is, this is the, this is the key question for investors right now, in my opinion, which is, is bad news going to become good news or is bad news, bad news? And we have a view that bad news in over the next, let's call it quarter or so, it's very likely to be bad news if it's bad enough. And the reason I say that is because we're talking now about losing uh, forward, uh, open, um, sort of forward guidance as a potential sort of uh, indicator that the Fed is ready to pause and stop hiking interest rates. And, and, and maybe, you know, they didn't say anything about the balance sheet. The balance sheet is going to be running on background, unfortunately, for risk assets. But when you're talking about heading into recession, the Fed needs to not pause. It needs to cut interest rates. It needs to expand its balance sheet. And those are the things that the market actually needs. And so what it's telling you is that the Fed is going to, assuming we get this growth slowdown that you and I both are, both of our you know, disparate set of indicators agree on, if we get this growth slowdown, we're going to be too far away from a Fed easing event, from a Fed easing catalyst in order to save the markets. And so it sets you up for really negative, you know, kind of Q3, Q4 until the Fed is really at a place where it's comfortable saying, no, I'm not only just pausing, I'm not just done hiking interest rates, I'm actually ready to start to cut them and actually supply the market with liquidity. So in our opinion, they're just too far away from doing that, given the guidance, given the inflation dynamics, given how strong the labor market is and, and that it's a lagging indicator. I perfectly agree with that conclusion, Darius. Uh, let's get to a few questions from the audience because we received a truckload of them today. So thanks for those. Um, and one question relates to the U.S. housing market. Uh, I can uh, basically sneak in here that pending home sales fell 20% in June. We got that confirmation today. And uh, we, we got a question uh, on whether um, a housing collapse could be uh, a trigger for the Federal Reserve to pivot. Uh, no, because it's already collapsing and they just hiked interest rates, <laughs> 75 basis <laughs> points. So, I mean, you look at the, some of the leading indicators for housing, right? Uh, new uh, uh, housing starts and building permits. They're both contracting at 40% on a three-month annualized basis as data through June that we got, uh, I want to say, last week. So the Fed had already had that data point in hand and decided to hike interest rates. So it's not housing. Um, again, let's be clear. The Powell reiterated this today very, you know, several times. The Fed wants to see a sustained period of below-trend growth. Right. That is that he literally said that but verbatim. And so a sustained period of below trend growth is going to sort of have certain segments of the economy, particularly those that are more rate sensitive, you know, in recession and other segments of the economy that are less rate sensitive, you know, probably continuing to do good. I think, um, you know, a great uh, juxtaposition to explain that um, is the sort of relationship between or the, the, the juxtaposition between Microsoft's, you know, its Q2 earnings and guidance. Very positive, you know, great beat, excellent. There's nothing, there's nothing negative to pick out there. But then you have companies like Walmart and Shopify, you know, get slashing earnings estimates and and you know, higher, cutting off, you know, their labor force. It's not this recession is not this monolithic thing that hits me and you and everyone else at the same time, or company A, company B, or company C at the same time. So the reality is, when you net it all together, it's likely to, that we have a sustained period of below trend growth. So it just again, it tells you the Fed is going to be too late to react with easing because they already expect it to occur. We have a great question from uh, Brian on our YouTube channel in regards to that discussion of, on below trend growth. Um, he asks you to explain how the market can perceive this as bullish for equities when Powell doesn't know how bad economic data is. Yeah, so it's again, let's, let's be clear. In the very short term, on any given day to day, the, the, the mass majority of trading um, is being the, the trading investment decisions that are being made are being made by robots and, and people who are not fun analyzing companies or analyzing macro fundamentals. 
as I said uh, this morning, or, or as I said earlier, we came into today with a 25% volatility risk premium in the S&P 500. That uh, going away alone, just people, you know, selling and monetizing those puts or, you know, dealers um, unwinding the, uh, the hedges associated with that will get you to a very aggressive squeeze, which is exactly what we saw um, today uh, in U.S. equities. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people are, you know, tripping over themselves to buy stocks. You know, it could just be, you know, vol targeting funds coming in into the close, dealers unwinding hedges. Uh, obviously, on any given day, you know, 80, 80, 80, 70 to 90 percent of uh, all equity turnover is systematic. And so systematic is you know, dispassionate. It's emotionless. It's not analyzing the Fed meeting like you and I. Uh, it's our, us. It's our job as investors and risk managers to ultimately kind of piece it all together so that we can predict where the market's going to be three, six months from now, not where it's going to be today or by tomorrow's close. Yeah, and it, it still makes sense to see this as um, medium-term bearish news since the Fed is not willing to admit to the slowdown yet. Um, and therefore, they will continue to hike into this uh, slowdown, in my humble opinion. Um, we have another great question from Sam in relation to our debate on forward guidance. Uh, he's asking you whether it doesn't give the Fed adequate uh, wiggle room to just do what the market is pricing now that they've removed the guidance. Maybe that can stop the market from thinking that they will hike into a recession because they aren't committing to anything. What's your take on that? Yeah, no, that that's a that's a very positive or that's a that's a definitely upside risk in the market from today because if you look at um you know kind of the the projected path of Fed funds, yeah, you know, I think we have somewhere you know roughly around 80 basis points of uh, of incremental hikes priced in through year end if you look at Fed funds futures. Um, so that's something that could come out of the market as growth data slows, and that could be a potential positive catalyst for the market. On the other hand, it could also be a negative catalyst for the market. We've seen plenty of times, you know, the 2008, 2009, 2001, 2002, plenty of times where the Fed is cutting interest rates and doing, you know, uh, balance sheet expansion where the market still goes down a significant amount. I mean, it's not the only thing that matters. I mean, the only thing, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on here, not the least of which is the fact that we still have not seen substantial revisions to earnings in a, in a material way that will allow fundamentally oriented investors to value companies. If we're heading into a hashtag actual recession, you know, when I don't when I say hashtag actual recession, I'm not saying the technical recession that's two consecutive quarters of G contracting GDP. I'm talking about a, the, what Powell said today, which what the NBR says is a statistically significant deviation that spans across sectors and lasts for multiple months. That's a real recession. A real recession has not been priced into asset markets, in our opinion, looking at our indicators. And more importantly, it's not even anywhere close to earnings estimates. So how the hell can you value a company if you have no idea what the range of probable outcomes is on a, on a, on a stock? So if we get into the real negative growth slowdown, you're going to start to see, in our opinion, more volatility because, again, it's just going to get harder and harder to value stocks and credits um, in, that, in that environment without the liquidity backstop from the Federal Reserve, which we know, just based on Powell's uh, guidance today, is likely to come way too late in the process. A couple of viewers are basically be begging us to debate the potential spillover effects from the ongoing energy crisis in Europe uh, to the U.S. market. Um, uh, we have a question on Twitter uh, relating to that, um, asking you, Darius, what happens to the U.S. equity market if Euroland heads for a hot energy stop this winter? Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, you're definitely going to have better thoughts on this than I am, my friend. Uh, but just quick, if you if Europe heads into an energy crisis, one, they're already in an energy crisis, let's be very mm. clear. <laughs> um, but two, if Europe heads into a, a deepening energy crisis, likely one that is caused by um, shenanigans by, uh, by Russia with respect to gas flows, what's going to happen is you're going to have a further positive shock to inflation. Uh, one, just as a function of, you know, in, in inflation going up there, but more importantly, um, as it relates to the global economy and the U.S. economy, you know, Europe's an integral part in global supply chains, particularly for higher value goods. And so you're going to have another threat to global supply chains that could, you know, kind of, you know, make the supply shock inflation more persistent. And then also you're going to have a negative shock to demand, right? I mean, Europe is our, I want to say Europe is our biggest uh, export partner. Not that exports really meaningful moving uh, moving the Dow here in the U.S., but, but the reality is you take away, you know, Eurozone and aggregate is the world's largest economy. You know, you take you you shock that economy into recession. It's going to have you know ramifications, spillover effects, spread widening effects. You know, your peripheral spreads, et cetera, and that all feeds back into you know people's willingness to take risk and capitalize. You know, junk rated companies here in the U.S. It's all interconnected. 
Yeah, and look at the development in the natural gas price over the past month in the U.S. Uh, even though the U.S. is a slight net exporter of, of natural gas, the price is increasing as a consequence of what's going on in uh, in Europe. And maybe we can bring up a chart on um, German electricity prices, Brian. It's chart six. Uh, I have a chart on the electricity pricing in December 2022. So electricity delivered this winter uh, and uh, as you can see we've reached a new all-time high today above 500 euros per megawatt hour um, and well uh, it goes without saying that it is multiple times the regular price for electricity in in europe so i don't think there is any doubt that this will uh cost jobs, it will lead to uh, manufacturing jobs um, closing down, it will lead to factories closing down for the winter in, in Germany and other surrounding countries if we don't get um, uh, natural gas flows running again from, uh, from Russia. What's your take on whether um, US investors can diversify or hedge the recession risk with assets abroad into such a scenario, Darius? Uh, that makes it's pretty. Uh, it's usually pretty difficult because it's usually um, you know kind of when you get into the teeth um, of recession or the teeth of a significant slowdown in growth. What's typically happening is you have capital flows into the U.S. Um, you know, our, you know, if you just think about it from a stock perspective, our companies are a lot more resilient, have a lot less earnings volatility than your average international company, and obviously we have the the deep the liquidity, uh, you know, sort of on a relative basis to everywhere else. Um, you know, the liquidity of the treasury markets. So, from a U.S. capital markets perspective, if things are good, you know, getting really bad, everyone turns to the U.S. as kind of the cleanest, uh, dirty shirt uh, in, in, a, in a dirty laundry band. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a sustainable trade. It just is what it is. Yeah. I, I would tend to agree with that assessment, and I'm personally still long the U.S. dollar versus the euro, um, seen from uh, from my desk here in the northern parts of the uh, European Union. Darius, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today, and uh, as you know, I've made it my trademark to always conclude with a meme in the Real Vision Daily Briefing, but not today, because um, oh. the tweet of the day is actually a video that I uh, <laughs> received in my inbox earlier today, and uh, I, I simply want to play this video uh, because it sort of concludes uh, our discussion in a very can timely I, manner. <laughs> can I can I can I can I interject before we play the video because yeah. I know it's going to be good, and I don't want to go after it. <laughs> there's a, there's one like a, there's a two quick things I want to say just to conclude because I know a yeah. lot of investors are watching the price action and probably very confused right now, and it, this is a confusing. Time. This is the part where the game gets hard. Proto Tudor Jones always said the last third of any move is always the hardest to risk manage. Right now, if you're bullish, and you know, I'm speaking to both camps here, bulls and bears, if you're bullish, you definitely want the data in the labor market to break down really quickly so the Fed can pivot very quickly. If you're if the data in the labor market does not break down really quickly, what's more likely to happen is the Fed is going to wind up over tightening and causing whatever recession we experience to be deeper and more protracted. Uh, if you're bearish, you're going to want the data to break down quickly, but have the labor market to break down slowly, which is the traditional path of how these things play out. So the highest probability path, in our opinion, is one where we see the significant slowdown in growth. It starts to drag the labor market lower, but not at a pace that causes the Fed to you know, materially pivot and back out of policy tightening. And so ultimately, the one statistic I'll leave everybody with before we play the, the, the fun video is when, you know, going back to that crowding analysis we, we produce uh, for 42 macro subscribers every day, you know, one thing that stood out to me this morning, the number one thing that stood out to me this morning was the sort of the, the deviation in what we call minus 25 or 25 delta, 50 delta put skew. So it's taking the implied volatility of 25 delta put options on a two month forward basis, subtracting that from um, the implied ball of uh, subtracting 50 delta put implied ball put options from that. And then we show that on a one year Z score basis. And we hit a minus 2.2 sigma move this morning heading into the event. So that in layman's terms, what that means is the market's view on forward-looking risks over the next two months is as low as it's been in years, in, in a year. I mean, that's a minus 2.2 sigma. So people are not hedged for negative outcomes in August and September and potentially in October and beyond as a function of this Fed meeting, and we would take the other side of that.
Thanks for that summary, Darius. That's an absolutely fair assessment uh, of what's going on in markets today. Let's see whether we can uh, get Brian to play the uh, video from the tweet of the day. It is basically a live look at Jay Powell trying to use inflation uh, to <laughs> to crack the economy. Um, so, uh, Brian, I hope you, you bring it up on the screens. Otherwise, uh, I'll say that um, it's been a pleasure to host you again, Darius, today. Uh, and uh, we will be back tomorrow with more action uh, in the Real Vision Daily Briefing. My colleague, Maggie Lake, uh, will be back tomorrow with uh, George Gonsalves. Thanks so much for today, Darius. Appreciate you, Andreas, man. Always a pleasure, brother. Be good. And thanks for watching out there. We'll be back tomorrow. I can see on Twitter and on YouTube and all over the place that everybody's struggling with these financial markets. How the hell do we invest? How do we make sense of this world? It's too complicated. There's too many things. What the hell is a yield curve? What does it mean to me? How does inflation play into my portfolio? These kind of questions are really important and they remain unanswered to this day. And that's why we've done something very different at Real Vision. We've actually decided to solve that problem at scale affordably for everybody. That is the Real Vision Academy and the Real Vision Investing course. We've created this incredible structured course so you can truly learn how to navigate financial markets and become a better manager of your own portfolio, your own wealth and your own destiny. These are so important. The other thing about the courses that you find online, not only do they charge you a fortune, but it's basically done by somebody who's got no experience in financial markets. This is different. This is built by the head of proprietary trading at Goldman Sachs Equities in London, who also worked with me at the GLG Global Macro Hedge Fund, Lex Van Dam. We took his incredible course, which he trained people for the BBC show Million Dollars Traders and turned it into something truly spectacular, taking it to when Lex never dreamed it could go. Now, Real Vision is always a little bit different as well. We don't make learning boring. I mean, we've filmed some of these videos in extraordinary places like bunkers underground to pubs. We want to make it feel natural, interesting, immersive. So when you come out the other side, you are a better investor. If you join us now, you get an incredible discount. Go to realvision.com forward slash the academy. See you there.